go straight to prayer, I think. So uh, if you are wondering why we're starting a bit late, we just sang awesomely, went back to singing first, and as well as our eating, so that's really good. Thanks for that, Al, and everyone that joined in. So uh, let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you, we bless you. Because of your loving kindness, your grace and mercy towards us, you sent Yeshua, your son, though innocent, completely innocent of all things. As a scapegoat, he took our sin upon himself. He bore the misery and suffering of the cross, and worse of all, separation from you, as he found out what it is Lord, to carry sin before you. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would not allow anything in this world, not even in us or in our lives, to take away the glory and the honour and the prize that he deserves, that he should have, that he must have, because of the great and terrible price that he's paid for us. We remember what the apostle said, my life is not my own, it belongs to him who paid for me. So I'm sure, Lord, everyone here will say, your will be done, Lord. Shepherd us, guide us, instruct us, change us. Remove or add, Lord, whatever needs to be removed or added so that we can reflect you and be fruitful and effective in this day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I just need to pray one more thing. Father, Lord, right now you are aware, Lord, that there's a very large Muslim gathering happening right next door. And Lord... You are God. They worship an idol made by men. It may as well be a piece of wood for all it's worth. Nevertheless, Lord, they are human beings created to worship, that they are misguided and led astray by false teaching. It's only a thing for sadness, not for anger. So we pray and ask, Lord, that somehow, by some miracle, that there being in New Zealand all these Muslim people in what at least used to be a Christian country, that somehow, Lord, at least some of them, you could reach out and save. Only you can do that, Lord. Only you can speak into their innermost being. So in the meantime, Lord, give us grace to be gracious around them and toward them so that the things they have heard and believe about Christians would be revealed untrue, at least about real Christians because you came and gave your life for all sinners, not just for the sinners that suit us, but all sinners, Lord, and everyone who is lost, you seek to recover. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight's topic is one you've probably never heard before, um, which is King Asa's Blessing. So I sat down, as I usually do, Usually, you know, I've told you before, usually I sit down on a Thursday because by Thursday, God is one way or the other brought the focus to something in the preceding few days. Things people say, things that come up, you know, it just emerges by Thursday. That should be the topic. But when I sat down, I was blank. Totally blank, because all I could think about is what's happening in Arise and Hillsong and all those places. And I've heard the most atrocious things on Facebook. People who don't want to believe that it's true, trying to defend the undefendable. The scripture says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good, right? They don't, they're not taking God seriously. But I think worse were the people that were glad that arises and, you know, basically imploding or exposed for what it is, same with Hillsong. Those things had to happen. But it's, we've got a baby crying, that's really appropriate, you know? Because these are, this is not a thing for rejoicing. God takes no delight in the destruction of the wicked, remember? Got a siren to go with it, God's agreeing. <laughs> Right? Emergency. So I think it's part of our narrow way understanding. There's a problem in the churches, which is things of the spirit and things of nothing more than filthy politics gets blurred together. 
even church politics, people whose God is their denomination rather than God. And that's what where people will sit and they'll gloat and they'll go, ha, 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 those Pentecostals or ha, ha, those whatever, right? As if, <laughs> as if they were any better. So part of our narrow way path is to rise above all that garbage, right? You have to remember that huge places like Arise are thousands of young people, particularly, who will face God on Judgment Day. Same as everyone else. You know, church is not about entertainment. Church is not about, you know, a social club. Regardless that that's how it's turned into in so many places, we all know that actually about salvation. A very serious thing. And on the day of the Lord, you couldn't be more serious, right? So when Jesus came into Jerusalem for the last time, what did he do? He knew what was going to happen, right? What did he do when he saw the city? He wept. And he said, if only you had listened, but now your house will be left to you desolate. This is Jesus saying this. What does he mean? God made a lifeboat, but the Titanic is sinking. You know? If only, paraphrasing, if only you had got into the lifeboat that I've put in front of you, but you would not get into it. So I'm going to have to watch you drown. So he's weeping over his own people because they wouldn't get into the lifeboat. They wouldn't believe their own prophets. If they had believed their own prophets, they would have believed him. Right? So we need to have that attitude at a time like this. And, and as I said, because it's happening globally, if you saw I posted something yesterday, I think it was, that since people have started talking about what's really going on on the rise, other people from other big churches are starting to come out and reveal that it's the same there. So this is God. Remember what we did from Nahum? He says, if you do not repent, I will lift your skirts up over your head and expose your nakedness. This is God doing this. Jesus said there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. So I sat there and I'm thinking about all that. I'm sat there and I'm weeping for all those young people who thought they were on their way to heaven, who thought they had a relationship with God, and then it turns out that the place that was probably most important to them in their life turns out to be a warehouse that just sells plastic packaged lies, right? And the people they trusted turned out to be completely untrustworthy. Having experienced that in the church I first went to when I was first saved, it is the worst experience. It is just the worst because you don't know whether you can still believe in Jesus anymore. You get into this terrible mental swirl of you don't know which is the lie. Is it that Jesus is the lie and therefore the church is just a lie just like him? Or it's only the church that's the lie, but who's Jesus then? So if there's no one around to tell them the truth, if there's no one around to push the lifeboat toward them, they sink. You know, I've seen all this before. This is what happened when Toronto came. So many people left the church. They thought, if this is church, I'm gone. This is, a, this is rubbish. You know? So I'm sitting there thinking all that, but I didn't know what to write, which was odd for me, right? So I did what you should always do. I prayed and I asked the Lord, God said, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask and be freely given. So I did that. And he answered me, and none of the above, I thought. He said, he just said, 2 Chronicles 15. And of course, did I know what that was? No. <laughs> My memory's not that good. So I had to look it up. 2 Chronicles 15. And it turns out, it's a narrow way 
thing, and it relates completely, absolutely, not only to the narrow way, but to what's happening with the things I was just talking about. So that gave me great confidence that it really was the Lord answering. So I'm confident to say, I'm no prophet, right, but I'm confident to say that this little bit of scripture is God's word to us right now. Let's read it together. We, we're just going to read the first um, seven verses of 2 Chronicles 15, starting in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord came on Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa, the king, Asa's the king, and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel was, out a true, was without a true God, without a priest to teach and without the law, lawlessness. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In those days it was not safe to travel about, for, for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Anyone read that before? I'd be surprised, honestly, but... So it was new to me, I can tell you. It was new to me. So who is this guy? So Azariah, you will have worked out, he's a prophet, okay? We don't need to know too much more about him than that. But the, the one who's interesting is this guy, Asa. Asa was the king of Judah. So remember, by this time the land that God meant to be one people of 12 tribes all worshipping in Jerusalem had split when two brothers debated over who should be king. So they split the kingdom, right? The 10 northern tribes went into total apostasy. They still used the name of God, but what they were worshipping and the way they were worshipping they had imported, thanks to Jezebel, from the Assyrians and the other pagan nations around them. So this is the worst kind of idolatry. It's bad enough. It's bad enough if you worship a different god that is openly a different god. That upsets God a lot. But what drives him nuts is when you worship another god but attach his name to it. You say that you are still worshipping the God of Israel, but you teach something different, you do it a different way, you know, you ascribe to him a whole different, to this God, a whole different character from the character of God. So in the, you will have read, when you're reading the Old Testament, every so often God will do something sovereignly himself. And often he says the reason he's going to do it and not wait for humans is for his name's sake, for the sake of his Shem. So now that you all know that Shem really means not just your name tag, but your character, right? It has to do with his character being slandered by idolatry, where his character falls out of sight of his own people because false teachers have so manipulated the supposed character of the God of Israel that what they're teaching no longer resembles him. So for the sake of his own character, for our sake, he intervenes. Otherwise, he would be lost to us. So every so often, he has to step in and do something drastic. So when, it, when he says, for my name's sake, in English, it sounds a bit selfish. Like he's like, oh, well, I'm really upset. You're like saying bad things about me, so... Here I come, I'm going to spank you. It, as if it's all about me, me, me. It's always the other way around. It's for our sake that before the, the, 
knowledge of the true and living God, his actual character, is completely lost thanks to idolatry. The worship of, we'll put it into modern terms, the worship of Jesus, but the Jesus they're preaching is not Jesus. You know, they've changed him. That's what the Israelites did. He will step in sovereignly. And the first thing he does is he exposes the false thing as false. You know, he lifts up their skirts and exposes them for what they really are. That's what's happening all around now. So, Azariah, a prophet, comes to Asa, who's the king of not the ten northern tribes, who are the big problem, but the two tribes that are left based around Jerusalem, Judah and Benjamin, Yehuda and Benjamin, right? Why is Judah so important to God? Because David, the king, is of Judah, and Messiah must be of the line of David. Judah is the tribe from whom Messiah will arise. So if anyone better not be in apostasy, it's Judah, right? Because from them, Messiah will come. And he is the truth, not a truth, not a mixture, certainly not a substitute. He is the definition of truth, right? They can't, God can't have games going on with Judah. So there's a separation. And to understand how Asa, who's a good king, his whole of his reign, there was peace in Judah, right? He's one of the rare good guys at that time. So when he reigned and when his father reigned, God was with them, right? And his father is an interesting guy, right? So imagine there's 10 tribes and two tribes. If they have a battle, who do you think would win? Just put God out of the picture for a second. What would you expect as a human? The 10 are going to smash the two, right? bit like Russia and Ukraine, right? Except one of them had God with them and one of them most certainly did not. Asa learned to be faithful from his dad. His father, Abiah, the king of Judah, was a God-fearing, righteous, holy man who took his job as king in Jerusalem very, very seriously and he commanded the removal of all idols from Judah. He commanded the exclusion of any kind of worship other than the worship of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to the laws of Moses. Right? He was a serious guy. So when the ten in the north decided they'd quite like Jerusalem, you know, let's just invade, they turned up with a massive army, 400,000, and in ancient times, that's like turning up with maybe a million men. Now, wars were quite small in numbers then, so to turn up with 400,000, that's massive, right? Who do you think won? Not the 10 northern tribes. They were sent home with their tail between their legs, and it wasn't 400,000 that made it home. A whole lot of them got to stay in, in where they were under the ground. This guy is a picture of God with them against all odds. I made a joke here. I think I'll share it because I smiled. That I said here that a buyer was really brave. How do we know he's really brave? Because he had 14 wives and 16 daughters. So he's, he's the man in the house with 30 women. That's, if that's not bravery, I don't know what is. <laughs> but that's the heritage of Asa, the king. So when Abiah died at peace with God, you know, there's peace in the land, and his son takes over, he's, that's the kind of person he is, right? So you would think, that's fine, nothing to worry about here. He'll be like his father. That's, you know, everything's good, right? God not taking any chances. He sends Azariah, the prophet, 
to speak to Asa. And we're going to look at the specific things he says because they are lessons for us right now. Because we are in a similar situation. We have something like the ten rebellious tribes because we are surrounded by things that say they're worshipping Jesus, but what they worship is definitely not Jesus, even though they stick his name on it. So there's very definitely a remnant, and it's not just us, of course, that we're, the, we're far from the, the whole of the remnant, but if you are really faithful to Jesus and concerned for the truth in the word, you are very definitely outnumbered in the, what the world would call the wider church by people who have no concern for the truth at all, right? So there's a, if you like, there's a direct lesson we can take because we have something in common with us and the Judeans. And we would like to think that we would, you know, we're going to stay faithful and we're not going to make any mistakes and things like that. But it's dangerous to think that way. So we're going to pay attention to why I'm absolutely certain God wanted us to learn something from two Chronicles 15. So somewhere near the bottom of the first page, you'll see the first box there, or the second box, sorry. I'm going to look at the things. What did God have to say to us of the king? The Spirit of God, capital S, right? So that's Ruach HaKodesh, came on Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. So it's not just the king, but all the people. The Lord is with you when you are with him. The Lord is with you when you are with him. Now that might sound obvious, but it's a really loaded statement. And to make it clearer what God was saying, we're going to look at where we've heard this before, but not in those words. Same message, but not in those words, or should I say having the same root, okay? So in the next box down, you'll see Malachi 3. We all like Malachi 3, right? Yes. Chapter, uh, sorry, chapter, verse 7. God says, Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. So he's speaking to a people who are going apostate, right? like this generation. What does he say? Return to me and I will return to you. It's conditional. Who has to move first? Us. He doesn't say, I'll return to you so that you can return to me. It's the other way around. Who knows the parable of the prodigal son? Everyone, right? Who can call out something about who moves first when it has a happy ending who moved first the son right the son realizes his mistake and goes back even though he doesn't expect to be rejected but what's really critical about where he meets his father where does he meet his father at home no where on the road why because as soon, <laughs> as soon as he starts to come back, his father comes out to meet him, right? His father doesn't wait for him to get all the way home. As soon as he turns around and starts coming back, the father goes out to meet him on the road and they finish the journey back together. Return to me and I will return to you. So if you're ever dealing with a backslider or someone who's realised they've been in a cult or something like that and thinks, oh, you know, how will God ever have me back? Now you've got something to say, right? Does it make sense? We look at the next example, Jeremiah chapter 4. I like his Hebrew name, Yirmiyahu Hanavi, Jeremiah the prophet. Verse 1. If you, Israel, will return to me, then return to me, declares the Lord. If you will put your detestable idols out of my sight and no longer go astray, and if in a truthful, just, and righteous way you swear as surely as the Lord lives, 
Then the nations will invoke blessings by him, and in him they will boast. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise your heart to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts. You people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, for in my wrath, notice it's wrath, so that's serious anger, right? Or, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. So it's repent or else the consequences will become unstoppable. You know, so there is a point, we covered this before, there is a point where God has truly actually had enough. Right? That's what he's saying to them. Last one, Zechariah 1 verse 3. Therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says, return to me, declares the Lord, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Three examples, there's lots of them actually, but I thought three would be enough. You see, there's that pattern over and over and over. God desires to save, but the covenant has conditions, remember. So, what's the English word for one word for return to God? Repent. So is it any surprise then what we see in the New Testament? Because someone might say, oh, that's all Old Testament, right? God doesn't say that anymore. Does he not? How does the ministry of Jesus start? It starts with the ministry of John. What does John say over and over? Repent, return to me, says the Lord. Why? Because the kingdom is at hand. Okay? The kingdom is at hand. The king is coming. Now that might sound like a good thing, Unless you're Jewish and you understand the great and terrible day of the Lord, what, what John is saying is the time for your indecision and playing games is running out. Turn back to the Lord before he arrives and you haven't. You know, that's, a, that's talking of judgment. So it's... The message of John the Baptist is the same as the message of all the prophets. Return to him. Why? Because if you do, he'll return to us. So just pausing for a minute to think of those poor people in those places that we were just talking about. What is God saying to them even though they probably may not know it yet? Exactly that. Return to me while there's still time. You know, because you thought you were worshipping me, but you're not. You're like Israel. Return to me. Put away your idols. Right? We're going to look at this in a bit more detail. But first, one extra thing. So when we say return to God, it has an unfortunate... Um, oh, let's ask, how often need, do you need to do that? And the answer is, as often as you turn away. As often as you turn away, turn back. Does anyone know a New Testament scripture about what ha that in practice? When I tell you, you'll all know it. It says, if we sin, what should we do? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right? How often? How often are you planning to sin? Never. How often do you actually sin? All the time. So we don't plan to, but we're human. We can't stop it, right? So how often does, is God planning to have to forgive us? Continually. But if you keep sinning and keep sinning until you basically no longer resemble a disciple, remember, nothing, no third party can snatch us from his hand, but we can leave. So to stay on the narrow way, to stay in the covenant, to stay his, requires that when we become convicted of sin, when we become conscious of our sin, when should you repent? Then. And understanding that it means return back to the straight way, you've wandered off course. Because when people say, oh, you have to repent, it sounds like, you know, the Supreme Court and you're, the hangman's waiting for you or something like that. 
really in practice, that's what God is saying. It's like, you're, it's like that annoying voice in your car on your nav navigation system that says, at the first possible moment, make a U-turn. You had that yelling at you? <laughs> well, that's what God's saying. When you go off course, when you divert too far from the narrow way, the Holy Spirit will turn into that navman voice. You know, at the first opportunity, you need to make a U-turn if you want to arrive. Return to me. You're off course. Oh, what if you don't want me back? No, no, you return to me. I'm already, on, I'm already all set to return to you. Why? Because I'm faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. The point is to save you and not to destroy you. But there are rules. Does that make sense? But the, we have to understand there's a continual process of repentance, not just the idea that I, I repented in 1980, whatever it was, and you know what I mean? So I've done that now. And the best way of understanding it is to look at John 15, which is the same thing put differently. John 15, verse 4. Jesus says to his disciples, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We've done this before, so of course, if he's telling you you have to remain, it makes it clear that it's possible to leave, right? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What does nothing mean? It, it means nothing worth having. It doesn't mean nothing at all. It's not that if you suddenly go back to being a pagan that you won't be able to drive your car. He means nothing of consequence, nothing that will survive Judgment Day. You know, it'll just, you, everything you do will just be fuel for the fire, worthless and burned up. You, you'll, live a, you'll live a busy but ultimately meaningless and pointless life. So when he says nothing, he means nothing worth having or nothing worth doing. Now, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Take note of that. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Not our topic, but why is that true? If my word remains in you and I am in you, Ask whatever you will, and it will be done. Is that a magic spell? What does it mean then? Because, you know, I, I was brought up in the church in the middle of all the vineyard charismatic stuff, and they would just stick in Jesus' name on the end of any old thing as if it was abracadabra, right? Because they said, but it says, ask whatever you will in my name, and it'll be done for you. What are they missing? Got to keep it in the context, right? There's an if in there. What's the if? If you remain in me and my words remain in you, he is the word of God. So he's saying, if you are in me and I am in you, so you are echad, as far as a human might be with God. You know? You, have an, you are in empathy with him. You are instructable and leadable by him, by his word. So what sort of requests do you think you will make? You'll make requests that are consistent with what Jesus already wants. You will pray and ask for things that God leads you to pray and ask for. It's conditional. You could almost cheekily say, if you agree with me, I'll do what you ask. Does that make sense? It's not this, what they turned it into, the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it thing of, you know, turning Jesus into a vending machine that so long as I sing him a couple of nice songs and say, put in Jesus' name on the end of whatever I want, that he has to give it to me because of this. When you read it properly. Also, when you ask in his name, 
this is written in Greek, right, but it's Greek trying to say a Hebrew thing, which is Shem. So when you ask in his character, consistent with him, you know, oh, please, Lord, I really hate my boss, please give him a heart attack and kill him. Is that, will he do that? Why, no, why won't he? Because it's not, it's not consistent with his character. So everyone who prayed that this morning, sorry. You know, do you understand? He won't answer prayer. Well, he, actually, he will still answer, but he won't give you what you want. He'll give you what you need. It's probably a spanking, usually. But do you understand? In my name means in my character. Anyway, that wasn't our topic, but I thought since we read it, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That's so important. So what happens ought to, our lives ought to be a reason for other people to believe in him. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. There's another if. If you keep my commands... You will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. What did we learn the other day? It's all right if you've forgotten, because it's, well, I think I only taught it once. What does, if you keep my commands, actually mean, if you're explaining it to someone, is it like the road code and I'm the traffic cop saying, you failed to keep the speed limit? Is it keeping a law like that? What does this actually mean? Because people think that's what it means, right? It sounds like that in English. To guard, that's it. So, so to cling to, to guard, to treat as, as if you're on the Titanic and you found a lifeboat, you know, and you're going to cling to that thing and not let anyone take it off you, right? So, so his commands, his way, his instruction, you cling to it for life. That's what he means. So, of course, if you're clinging to that, having treating it as being treasure, you know the parables about the kingdom, the pearl of great price? You know someone found this amazing pearl, what did they do? They spent everything they had to buy the whole field just to get the pearl. He says the kingdom is like that. This is a similar meaning, you know? So, yeah. Again, we're not trying to be justified by the laws if we're running around trying to keep God's law like the road code because we wouldn't do any better than we are at keeping the road code and most Kiwis don't even know what the road code says, let alone keep it. But these things, why does he keep saying, if you remain in me, if you remain in me? Well, to understand it better, he says, what if you don't remain in me? If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away. A branch that is thrown away. He's making sure they understand that it's possible to be lost. It's possible for you to walk out. Remember, nothing can take you from him, but you can leave. So when he says, when he's the nav man, he says, at the first occasion, make a U-turn because you're off course. If you ignore and just stubbornly keep driving away, you can be lost. Where does that end? The lake of fire because you can drive right out of the covenant, you know, right out of the vine and be just become a useless, fruitless branch that's only good for burning. His word's not mine. Hold his commands precious. Keep them as far as it's up to you. No one can keep them perfectly. But God's no dummy. Remember, he judges the thought and intent of the heart. He knows the ones that are urgent to live by them, no matter that we fall short every day. Does that make sense? It's not about, I often say, I say this not knowing whether it's still true at school, but in my day, every report card had two different columns. If it and attainment. So in maths, I got C for effort and A plus for attainment because I was a maths genius but unbelievably lazy. 
so I never did any work. But I could pass everything without studying. So I didn't get a very good mark for effort, but I got a great mark for attainment, right? Whereas in phys ed, do you still call it that? Physical education? Sports? I'd get like a C for effort, I don't know how, and an F for attainment. Because <laughs> I was useless at it. I got it. I had asthma and all those things. I couldn't run 50 yards, you know, I couldn't play sport. So there was this difference between the effort you're applying and how, how well you actually did measure it against some scale, right? God is a little bit like that. When he judges the thought and intent of your heart, it's more about the effort column. God knows the one who's taking, who treasures his commands enough that they are, even if they don't do spectacularly well in the attainment column, they're getting an A in the effort column. You know, it's their, it's their purpose to get better, to mature. You know, they hate, they hate their own sin. They don't sit there wallowing in it and feeling sorry for themselves. You know, they repent and they pick up their cross and they go again. So every day is a process for them, longing to be more Christ-like because they, they love his word and therefore they love him. You know, so on judgment day, I'm certain that it's the effort column that is more important than the attainment column. Right? And you say, well, what about some great missionary and thousands of people came to the Lord and oh, I've never brought anyone to the Lord. Those guys have an anointing to do that. right? And Jesus said, to those to whom much is given, how does it end? even more is expected. But to those to whom only a little is given, only a little is expected. God sovereignly chooses to anoint someone with the, his power to do something they couldn't do of themselves. So if there's a, a great evangelist or something rather, that, and people come under conviction when he's preaching, it's no talent of that guy it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit with that guy, right? But you say, oh, he's so blessed. No, he's so burdened. Because God's expectation, the accountability for what he does with that is so massively higher than for someone whose anointing is to take care of kids' church or something like that with five kids, you know, or whatever it may be. It's not about scale. It's about what you do. With it. I, I had a Salvation Army officer say to me, oh, I really like to do what you do, but I can't do it. I don't have that confidence. What should I answer him? Because in actual fact, he's quite a good Bible teacher. He just doesn't teach like I do. But what should I say to him? I said this. I'll tell you exactly what I said to him. To those who are faithful, with a little, even more will be added. But if you are not faithful with a little, he won't waste any more on you. Be f therefore, be content to be faithful for what you have. Because when you can show that you are faithful with the burden and the gifting and the resources and like that, if you can be faithful with that, do something with that. Because remember, it's not about scale then he can trust you with more if that's his purpose. Does that make sense? And it has a flip side as well, which is never be jealous of anybody else's ministry because if it's massive compared to yours, so is the accountability massive compared to yours. So will their sleepless nights be massive compared to yours. You understand? Because at the end of the day, it's God and not us. Never... Never, that's why you should never put anybody on a pedestal in ministry or anything like that. Because if they seem to be greater than someone else, it's only that God is, is revealing himself in, in a way that appears greater. Appears greater. But greater things are happening one-on-one -on -one that you never see in, when someone visits the sick or 
visit someone in prison, or, you know? It's not about scale. It's about being faithful with the measure that you're given. And God may and often does. As people mature, he entrusts more to them if they can be faithful with what they started with. It's a big mistake that people want to rush into some huge ministry. It's another, I don't want to pick on the Pentecostals, especially now, but it's another mistake in youth ministry of throwing people in, saying, oh, I'm a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit, therefore you should be able to do this when they're babies. You know? Even the Apostle Paul, the Apostle, the, did Paul know something about Scripture? Yes. Remember, he's the most accomplished rabbi in the whole land. No one knew the Scripture more than him. How long was it before he could be in Christian ministry after God took his side away and then gave it back. Did he go out the next day evangelizing? What happened to him? The great rabbi who knew every word in the, in the scripture. What happened to him? He disappears. He goes away into the wilderness. No one hears from him for two years. For two years, God counseled him. He had to be prepared even with all his learning, even with the Holy Spirit, he had to be prepared. You know, so you can see what a terrible mistake it is to just say to a almost baby Christian, oh, well, you have the Holy Spirit now, you're born again, you can just... And that's, you know, they're talking about the people being burnt out in these places. That's what's happening. They're just babies. They don't know anything. And they're being thrust out with this massive accountability completely unready and, un and not really anointed because God doesn't work like that. Anyway, don't want to get sidetracked. So, the remain in me tells you that the return to me is continual. It's not repent once. It's repent as often as necessary to remain. And if you wake up and you haven't remained, go back. Does that make sense? Let's go down. And I want to just mention, like verse 6 here says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away, right? We need to understand that a bit more. And it turns out, that we're back in Second Chronicles 15 to discover that. So verse 2 now of our key scripture says, The Lord is with you when you are with him. So we understand that more. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. What's the order of that? It's conditional, right? What's the order? Who goes first? Us. Remember, nothing can snatch us from him, but we can leave. It's the same here. If you leave him, he'll leave you. And why am I saying leave? Because that word forsake, what does forsake mean? It's actually quite archaic English. I doubt if anyone even uses that word in a sentence today. But... It's not in English, of course. It's azab. Azab in Hebrew. And it means to leave. To break away. Remember the branch that's broken off? It means to be broken away, snapped off. So if you snap yourself off from the branch, from the tree, you stupid branch, if you snap yourself off and leave, you are separated from him. The, when he says that he will leave you, it's your doing. So if you cut yourself off from him, you will be cut off. Why? Well, you cut yourself off. That's what he's saying. We don't want to dwell on that too much, but that's what it means. To forsake him is to leave, to break away, to be cut off. You're the one doing it. Now, it says there in our verse 2, if you seek him, 
He will be found by you. Have you heard that before? Many, many times. And, and everybody's, if, if Facebook's anything to go by, the most, what do you think the scripture that I, you too probably, if someone posts up a bit of scripture, what do you think is the favourite of all favourites that always gets posted up in the last few years? It's Jeremiah 29. You know, I know the plans I have for you. So when they post that up, generally, what are they, what are they wanting you to think it means? And you can tell because they usually say it when they say, you know, they'll write a comment. What's the idea they, that people who post that are usually saying? It's not rocket science. They're saying, God has a plan for my life. That's only partly true. He has a hope for your life. What's the problem with a plan? When you tell people that God has a plan for your life, what's the danger of that? There's a danger. You might have a plan for your kids to go to university, right? What if they leave school and say, I've decided to drive a truck. What happened to your plan? It's been torpedoed by their free will, right? The problem with saying God has a plan for my life is it tends to lull people into thinking that it, it will inevitably happen. So when it's true that God has a hope for your life in the way that you plan for your kids to go to university, but your free will, your ability to leave, your ability to rebel, can torpedo his best hope for you. So it's not like God, sovereign as he is, turns you into a robot and forces you to a certain path. He will do everything to make that path shine against other paths, you know, and lead you and do everything in this hope that you will, you know, because I say, people say, oh, who gets to go to heaven? What do you think the best answer is? Those who want to be there. You know, and if they want to be there, then they'll come on his terms. Right? Then they'll sacrifice the world to have that. But if driving the truck's more important to you, you'll drive the truck, regardless of your parents' greatest desire for you, which is probably better than your own stupid choice, but it won't change the fact that you'll end up driving the truck. Right? That's the danger of free will. So we have to understand that Jeremiah 29 is partly that only up to the, what I just shared. God has a perfect hope for you. He has plans, if you'll cooperate, that are the best thing you could walk in, a purpose for which he created you, if only you'll come. But not plans like it's inevitable because he turns you into a robot. Does that make sense? So it's true up to that point, but there's something about Jeremiah 29 we have to understand. So we're going to read the little bit of it, because it's actually quite a long chapter, but a little bit. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you. Notice it says my good word to you, not his will. To bring you back to this place. Let's pause there. Why does he say my good word, not my good will? Why, why do they know it's going to be 70 years in Babylon? Because Jeremiah, the same Jeremiah, warned them, if you do not repent, God will send the Babylonians and you will be captives for 70 years. You know, But after that, he will bring you back. That's what God means talking here. I'm going to keep my word. You didn't repent. 
So you're doing 70 years in Babylon. But after that, just as I keep my just as I kept my word to bring Babylon and now you're going to do the whole 70 years, but I'll keep the rest of my word as well, which is that after that time I'll bring you back. And that's what goes on to say. My good word for you to bring you back to this place, meaning Israel, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And then, this is where you've heard that before, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Context is really important. When he says, I know the plans for you, what has to come first? The 70 years. The promise in context is, you disobeyed me. Now there's consequences, but I promise. I know the plans I have for you. My plan is not to destroy you. This has happened to you to save you. This has happened to you to teach you. This has happened to you to bring you to repentance. Because my plan in sending Babylon is to break your stubbornness to save you. That's what he means by, I know the plans I have for you. Everything that's happening is for your salvation and that of your people after you, your generations after you. You yourselves wouldn't listen, so you get to spend the rest of your lives in Babylon, but your children will return. Why? Because I'll bring them back. And he did. Right? If you want to see a description of Jesus at the second coming... Ring about, read about King Cyrus the Persian that God anointed King Cyrus to defeat the Babylonians and after he destroyed the Babylonians who everyone assumed was impossible to defeat he, what does he say to the Jews who are slaves in Babylon so when he arrives in Babylon there's all these Jewish slaves and all the gold and everything from the temple in Jerusalem is in Babylon in the tre Babylonian treasury because Cyrus, though he's not Jewish, is anointed by God as a type of Messiah, he says to them, take everything that the Babylonians stole and go back and rebuild the temple and worship your God there in Jerusalem. And he pays for the rebuilding of the temple. Cyrus does. He's not Jewish. There's no record that he ever became Jewish. But under the power of God, he says, you are no longer slaves in Babylon. Go home. He's the conquering king, right? You would think that, oh, you, you were Babylonian slaves, now you're my slaves. No. God kept his word. That is a picture of what Jesus does for the captives in the last days. The, the second coming he comes back he destroys Babylon the Great and he causes the rebuilding of the temple etc etc you know the establishment of the kingdom and, and the restoration of true and proper worship of God from the survivors those who are brought back anyway slight side note so The consequence of reading this in context is the blessing follows the correction. First the 70 years, then the restoration of all things. If you don't want to wait the 70 years, this order of things applies all the time and everything. What can stop Babylon coming in, a per in your life? What can stop exile and judgment coming in your life? Repentance. Remember, it's because they wouldn't listen. It got to the point where Babylon 
arrive just as God said it would. So unless you, if you want the happy part, the bit that people like to quote, you know, plans to give you a future and a hope, to restore, what does it say here? You'll call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you. I will restore your fortunes and gather you back from where you were scattered. Restore your fortunes. Everyone wants that, right? But he's saying to them, you did the crime, you have to do the time now. But in the end, this is to save you. Well, the shortcut version of that in a personal life is when God has you under correction. Repent. Don't be stubborn. But sometimes you end up in a time like now when judgments fallen, fall in, past tense. All these things are happening. It's too late to turn them back because the church for 30 years has refused to listen. It's too late. So I'm sharing this stuff so that you can encourage people that it is God trying to save them. He sends exile to break stubbornness. His plan all along, though, is to bring them back. He scatters them to teach them what it's like without him in order to have them seek him. How? With all their heart, mind and strength. Remember what heart means? We did this the other week. When got, with all their heart means what? all your innermost being, all who you really are, not superficially, not just paying lip service, not just some external, you know, for real, right? For real. But the restoring of fortunes only follows repentance, the returning, and not superficial, not skin deep, taking up the cross to live a crucified life, we have an example of this in the New Testament. Who's read the Gospel of Philemon? Most people look at me blankly. Who? It's right there in the New Testament. Most people I know have never read it because it's really short and no one ever mentions him, right? So we're going to read him now. Philemon. Chapter 1, verse 10. I appear, this is Paul writing, so I better just put it in the context. So Philemon is a friend of the Apostle Paul, right, and a believer. And he has a slave who steals. Now, does anyone know how slavery works in Hebrew culture? It was illegal to keep slaves, right? But if you, ha if you had a debt and you couldn't pay it, you could work it off. So you went into a formal contract, you were called a bond servant, you know? So you were, for all intents and purposes, a slave, but by choice. And your work was counted toward your debt until your debt was repaid. So that's what this guy is, except he stole money from Philemon and ran away. And he ran away to Rome. But in Rome, he collided with someone who knew him, which is the Apostle Paul. And Paul recognised the runaway slave of Philemon and confronted him about his sin, and the slave got saved. Right? This is important because we're going to focus on the guy who got saved. So when the story starts, he's sinned, he's fled, he's run away. So he's a picture of like the apostate church. He's a, he's a picture of a backslider. He's a picture of all those things, right? Let's look and see what Paul has to say about him, though. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. Onesimus is the slave. Paul calls him a son. Is he actually a son? No, because Paul's not married. Right? So he's adopted him as a son. What does that sound like? That's what God does to us. We're not biological children of God. He only has one of those in a sense. 
the begotten of God is just one, right? We are by adoption. So Paul is not calling him, hey, you're, you know, you're a slave. He, no, he doesn't call him that. He says, my son. Family. Who became my son while I was in chains. Paul was actually in prison in Rome at the time. Formerly, he was useless to you. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. And I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent because Onesimus is in de- you know, he's under contract, indebted to Philemon, right? So Paul is saying, I can't interfere with that. Right? But I'd like him to stay with me, but you know, he's your guy. Could find my place again. I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Now this really important next thing he says. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. No longer as a slave, but as a dear brother. The reason for the separation was so that you could have him back for good. What Paul just says is really the theme of every exile. The exile to... Assyria of the ten tribes, the exile of the two tribes to Babylon. Them going away for a time, them losing them for a time, was in order to have them come back for good. The parable of the prodigal son. The father lost his son. Remember, he was lost, but now he's found. He was lost only for a time. But the experience of being away was so bad that all he wanted to do was come back. And when he came back, did he ever want to leave again? Hell no. Do you understand what Paul's saying? Why am I sharing that? Because you can share this with people who are backslidden or if you come across someone who's so spun out by what's happening in a rise or any of those places like, and you just think that's it, it's it. God has abandoned me or something like this. You can explain to them, no, God has done this because he wants you back for good, not wandering away, not being lost to him. A, a time of separation is to bring about a permanence of return. But you have to be willing. Return to me, you go first. And I'll return to you. But understanding that, it's much more powerful for you to explain than just sitting there and saying, well, Jesus loves you, I'm sure, you know, that kind of stuff that people say, which is all true, but not very helpful. Let's let's, uh, see then that the gospel according to Jeremiah 29 concerning a whole nation is replayed with Onesimus. Onesimus is like them. You know, it's the same story. So when the crime is paid for, if you like, when the time is done, he can return. But this time, his Fortunes will be restored. He doesn't return as a slave. He returns as a brother. Paul is saying to Philemon, receive him as a brother, not as your servant. Does that make sense? Very important for us, if there are people like that in our lives who have wronged us and even left the church and things like that and have gone, bring, God brings them back. It's like prodigals. Remember what Paul says to Philemon, you know, he was your slave who stole from you, but God has done something. Now he's like a son to me. Receive him back as a brother because that is what he has become. Does that make sense? God willing, that's what will happen to everyone like that in your life. 
John 15. Uh, where are we? Make sure I've got my place. Ah, okay. Just on that same subject, John 15, verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. We know what that means. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. I've called you friends, for all that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. And in John 8, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. It's this difference between a temporary belonging and a permanent belonging. The household in question is God's household, of course. So that's what Paul's saying to Philemon. He was your slave, a temporary member of your household. But now receive him as a brother, a permanent member of the family. We're no longer slaves, right? If we're really Christ's disciples, we're no longer slaves. We're no longer temporary members of the household. We are adopted as children, permanent members of the family, unless we choose to leave. Let's get over to page four. Go back to Second Chronicles 15 and look at the next bit, which is pretty fast. For a long time Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In those days it was not safe to travel around, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, and one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. Given the, some of the things we've lo been looking into in recent weeks, let's look at the first thing here. It says, without a priest to teach and without the law, that's a famine for the word. Remember what we said from Habakkuk, uh, Amos 8 rather? That there, at the end there'll be a famine for the hearing of the word. There'll be a, a drought, it will not rain. The spirit will be withdrawn. Remember we did that a little while ago? So the same thing here. God is saying for a long time, the land was without the word of God. That's what it means by there's no priest and no one to teach them the law. They were without law. Lawless. Lawlessness is the state of the world when Antichrist is here. So this description is of the past is actually a description also of the world's future that there'll be, for a long time, it'll see like God has vanished, that you, you won't be able to get his word. It's lawlessness. It's actually not a very long time on the clock, but it will feel like forever if you're in it, right? Then it talks about that it wasn't safe to travel around because of all the violence and war and everything going on. Why? It says because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. It's God causing it. What is that? A picture of. This is the tribulation. So this is talking about history, but history that points to the future. When there's lawlessness and the word of God is nowhere to be found, at the, coinciding with that is tribulation. Nation against nation, wars, famines, violence. Look at just the news today. When I was a kid, there'd be one firearms offence that made the paper maybe every two years. It was so shocking, it always made the front page. Now, we had two in Wellington today. You know, it's almost a daily event now. Lawlessness, right? The things go together, so it becomes dangerous because lawless people don't care about each other. They become selfish, they do whatever they like to get what they want. It's tribulation, time of distress, it's God stirring them up. Tribulation. In their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. You see the purpose of tribulation? They have a saying, there are no atheists in the trenches. You know, so when the mortar bombs are landing, when the machine gun bullets are an inch above your head, 
what are all the soldiers in the trench doing? Praying. Even the ones that don't believe in God. That's what tribulation is meant to do. It's meant to cause you to realize that in your own strength, you are powerless. You can't fix the world. You can't save your life. You can't stop the violence. That's a sad thing of, like, our government and that, uh, that whole liberal thing, make the world a better place. They don't realize that in the strength of human beings, it is a, a futile task. Because you're up against human nature and you lose. The tendency of human nature is towards greed, crime, selfishness, and murder. Expressed in wars and all that stuff, but you know, that's basically it. So if you only have human nature, you don't get peace in our time, right? So tribulation is designed to make a last batch of people realize that the promise of all that politics and everything is fake and like an atheist in the trenches cry out to God saying God if you're there it would be a good time to turn up have I told you about that commando sergeant big Scottish guy tell you very briefly real story right he, he I'll jump to the end he ended up spending the next 30 years of his life as a minister went and trained as a became a Christian when trained as a minister, had a great ministry, right? But it started as an atheist, massively powerful guy. I don't know if you met many Scotsmen, but some of them are just gigantic, right? So he was one of those. And he's in the Marine Commandos on a raid against the French coast with, during World War II, right? And they attacked this heavily defended place called Saint-Nazaire. And it was way up a river in France. And to get to their target, they had to go in these little wooden torpedo boats made of plywood, right? And they had gasoline petrol engines. Gasoline and plywood and German bullets are not a really good combination if you're on the boat. So he didn't believe in God and he's standing... Have you seen the World War II uniforms? They're made of wool. What happens to wool when it gets wet? It's really heavy. And their boots are leather and... All his vest is full of grenades and ammunition for his machine gun and everything. So there's no way he can swim, right? That's if he knew how to swim. But like most people of his day, he didn't know how to swim. So he's more than 100 metres from each shore because the boat's right in the middle of the river. And they get hit. And the petrol tank catches fire. Now you've got a wooden boat with about 1,000 gallons of aviation fuel that's now burning. He doesn't know how to swim, and even if he did, even an Olympic swimmer, it's not going to make it 100 metres or more to the bank with all the stuff on, right? And there's no time to get it off. So his own testimony was, he, he thought he'd heard someone say that drowning wasn't the worst way to die, but being burnt alive would be unbearable. So he stepped to the edge of the boat, deciding that the only thing he could do for himself is not burn. Right? He resigned himself that his life was over, but at least I won't burn, I'll just go down. It's in the middle of the night, by the way. It's dark. And he almost flippantly, he said he almost flippantly, only, he felt like he only half meant it. He said, God, if you're real, this would be a good time to tell me, right? And then stepped off. That you, you would have to call that the most half-hearted, right? Mm -hmm. He stepped off and, as expected, shot to the bottom of the river like a stone. And he remembered looking up and seeing the starlight just disappearing and then total black because the river was so deep. Uh, this river and what was at the end of it was the only place in the world large enough to repair the Germans' biggest battleship. So this is a deep canal, right? Foot to the bottom. And he even remembers thinking, this isn't so bad, as he's starting to lose oxygen. And then suddenly, he finds himself coughing and spluttering and sucking in air, and his hand flies up, and he feels something, and he grabs it. And on both sides of the river, all the way along, 
are concrete walls. They're really high, too high to climb out. For 500 metres, it's smooth concrete, except exactly where he is, there's an iron ring for tying up a boat, sticking out, and he is holding it. For the rest of the night, as the battle raged over, nobody saw him in the water, holding on to this iron ring, while he sat there, unable to understand, because he's watching the boat burning and sinking, a hundred metres away, but somehow in the blink of an eye, he went from the bottom of the river to the only place he could be saved. And he had this conviction from God, I am. Unsurprisingly, it, uh, he ended up a prisoner of war, but unsurprisingly, at the first opportunity, he trained to be a priest. He trained to be a minister and to minister as a disciple and a witness for God, right? You can't not take it, pay that attention when God does something like that. It's impossible, right? Physically impossible. <coughs> but that's an example of tribulation bringing someone... You know, he's a, afraid of nothing, a massive Scotsman with a whole lot of grenades and a machine gun, right? Everyone needs to be afraid of him, not the other way around. But God brought him to a place in that tribulation where he could be heard. Does that make sense? So people talk about trials and all the rest of it, but really it's, it's, it affirms, if you like, God's purpose in sending those things is to break stubbornness, to break pride, and to bring about repentance. Okay, let's crack on. So, in their distress, like that guy, they turned to the Lord and the God of Israel, and they sought him, and he was found by them. Godly sorrow drives them past their pride to their knees, and they seek him for real, as they realize that without him they're done for. They return for real, not super, they return for real, not superficially. He was found by them, it says, but only after they sought him with all their heart, mind, and strength. You get the same thing, this godly sorrow is an important thing to understand. 2 Corinthians 7. Paul had to write a letter to the Corinthians and no one knows what it said because, you know, there's first and second Corinthians? There's actually second and third Corinthians. The first letter is lost, right? But whatever he said, the Corinthians were out of control, right? There was sexual immorality going on like you wouldn't believe. So he wrote them a pretty sharp letter and it hurt them. You know, they felt really, they were scared and hurt and, oh, you can't say that, all that sort of thing. We don't know exactly what he said because, like I say, the letter's lost. But here he says, he's writing about that letter. Even if I caused you sorrow, so this is 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, get this, but because your sorrow led to your repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, so that you so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. Remember where we talked about clinging to God's word, suddenly valuing it? That's what he's talking about. So even here, see in the New Testament, it's that same thing. God uses a time of calamity, a time where he seems to have you know, been away the purpose is always to bring you to where you wake up like the prodigal son and seek him for real this time. Because usually it happens to people who are only superficial before. You know, who think they knew God, but they really didn't. Again, like all that's going on around us. Who's been somewhere where in a church where they're always praying for revival? 
who've been around churches that are always praying for revival, right? How do they try and bring about revival generally? Give me some ideas. Because you've been there, right? What sort of things do they do in order to try and bring about revival? They have fun stuff. Yeah, fun stuff. What else? What do they do towards God to bring about revival? Think of Hillsong because they're a perfect example. What do they do? Lots of singing. Praise and worship, right? Praise and worship. Mostly praise and worship. So much praise and worship, hardly any preaching. Right? What's the problem with that approach? The problem with the approach is it's godly sorrow that brings about repentance, that brings about restoration. Return to me, and I'll return to you. Revival is actually about God returning to us. About reconciliation. That's what real revival is. Where God, who seems to have left us, comes back. But we have to come back first. That requires repentance. And the repentance inevitably requires tears. We're not sorry. So when we charge up to God, totally unrepentant, totally unsorry <laughs> for being, you know, in idolatry of God knows what, and think that you can somehow sort of purchase revival by singing him enough songs, by praising him enough, as if he had an ego problem. Have you ever thought about that? People, I've heard people say, God, God is lifted up by our praises. What does that say about God? That he's dependent on us. I've heard people preach that, that God can't do miracles unless we lift him up. What? What did God say to Job? Have you read the book of Job? Job, actually, in Hebrew. But what? You know, Job's friends are always counselling him the wrong stuff and everything, and Job's complaining in the end. What does God say to him at the end? It's a classic line. Best line in the Bible, probably. Job's and his friends are like lecturing God. You know, that's what churches do. They complain to him and they lecture him and they tell him everything he needs to know. Right? What does God say to Job? He says, Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth and set the stars in their place? Eh? <laughs> Does he need our help? Does he need lifting up before he can do anything? Before we existed, he made everything. He doesn't need us at all. He is the sovereign creator of the universe. It is insanity to reduce him to someone with an ego problem that needs inflating. But they sit there singing all those songs over and over as if he was like that, thinking that at some point he'll be happy enough, you know, inflated enough, to go, oh, I feel really good now. Oh, I think I'll bless these people because oh, it's a really nice song. You see what you're doing to the image of God when you do that? You're reducing him to like some sort of needy teenager that needs their ego pumped up. Right? And worship, what is worship according to God? If you're in the worship team, what would the, if we had a worship team here, what would it consist of? I'll give you a clue. No musicians. What would the worship team consist of? Teachers. To worship him is to study the word, to show yourself approved, and to take care of widows and orphans. That is the proper worship of God. Right? Scripturally. So singing his praises is not for his benefit, by the way. We are commanded to do that. It's for our benefit. All the psalms, right, that sing his praises are to be sung. They're all sung. And if you go to a synagogue and 
the Psalms are still a big part of the normal cycle of scripture in the synagogue, but anything that's a Psalm, there's a special guy in the congregation who's chosen, usually more than one, but a guy, and he's called the Cantor, Cantor, right? And so if it's a Psalm, he stands up and he sings it. The Psalms are always sung, okay? So when David praised the Lord, those are the psalms. They're sung. Right? But apart from that, <laughs> they're for our benefit. Do you notice if you're really down, where does the Spirit quite often direct you? To the psalms. Why? Because the psalms are God's emergency ward. You know, the book of Psalms is the ED of the Bible for immediate relief because it, all of them remind you, ground you of who he is, who you are, and, you know? Yeah. Immediate first aid psalms. Anyway, almost done. Let's look at the last part. Oh, so, sorry, just to make sure we understood that last bit. So if you want revival, what do you have to have? Repentance. The church has to reach a point of repentance it has to get real where it seeks them with all that heart, mind and strength for real, not just superficially. So would I like to see re revival in the church? Hell yes. But that would mean this apostate, this mess we're looking at, would have to repent. So what God going to do? Tribulation. What he always does. He'll send them away for a while so that they can return back forever, God willing and them willing. Let's go on. Second Corinthians fifteen oh, Corinthians Second Chronicles, sorry, fifteen now verse seven says, But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Be strong, do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. So here's where I really believe he's saying this right to this to us now. Just like King Asa, we're in a world surrounded by wickedness. We're outnumbered in the church. Most of the church is preaching a different gospel, running after a different Jesus. That's just reality. So just like the Judeans were outnumbered by the ten tribes, the remnant who actually care are well and truly outnumbered by the false church. So we have a lot in common. A lot in common. Be strong, do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Over to page 5. Romans 2, we're going to look at this now. It's about what does it mean your work will be rewarded and so on. Romans 2 verse 5. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. Self-inflicted destruction, in other words, because of your unrepentance. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, for God will repay each person according to what they have done. Notice what they've done, not just what they believe. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. He's impartial in his judgment. Impartial. Nothing has changed. Those who by, by perseverance and doing good Perseverance, keeping going. 1 Timothy 4 verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Persevere in them. Not just knowledge of the truth, walking in it. That's why he means, he says, not just your doctrine, but your life. So not just what you teach, you need to be an example of what you teach. Not just a hearer, but a doer also. Right. But the key there is even the New Testament, perseverance, keep going, don't turn back, don't turn to the left or the right, don't stop. 
you understand that? It's a bit like the remain in me. Repent, yeah, but continually. Don't leave. Don't make me say come back because you haven't left. Persevere in doing what's right. Is this making sense? I hope so. Now, I don't think I've ever shared this before. Slightly nervous about it, but anyway, I will. So, you all know my testimony and you all know how much misery I've had as a result of being sent to talk to a church that doesn't want to listen. However, on the 6th of December 1992, and on the 20th of July 2010, and again on December of 2012, God sat me down and convicted me each time so greatly that I wrote these dates in my Bible. So it wasn't just like a vague thought, it was like, sit, <laughs> listen. And each time it's this exact same scripture that I would have forgotten in the meantime, right? He brought me back to it. <laughs> So this is personal to me, but it has a lesson in it reinforcing what we just learned. And it's from Revelation 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. See, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. In other words, he's saying, even those who oppose you, even those that are trying to wipe out your faith, they cannot. I've opened the door in front of you and they cannot shut it. They cannot. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name, his Shem. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, false Christians. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. See that? Since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What's he saying? Like that was said to me, right? But it's really said to all of us. What's he saying? It matters to him. It's no small thing to him that we persevere and do not deny his character. In other words, that we stay true and that even in the midst of taking all the you know what, from those that would... The people that don't love the truth try super hard to get you to agree with them to justify themselves. They want you to admit you're wrong so that they can go on in their lie. Because if you're not wrong, they're dead. They don't want to repent, so they work overtime to convince you to give up the truth. That's what happens, right? But God is saying here, because you have persevered, because you have not given up or denied my, says name, but you know that means Shem, right? That denied who I really am. Then these things that he promises, that he'll keep you from the time of trial that's coming on the whole earth, that he'll write his name on you. What, where have we heard that before? It's Ezekiel 8 and 9. Remember the vision that Ezekiel's given? about all the apostasy in Jerusalem and the idolatry in the temple. And God says, there's a man all in white with a writing scroll comes. And Ezekiel sees that he's told to go all around the city of God and look for anyone who's weeping over the true nature of what's happening. 
weeping for God's people, weeping because of apostasy. Not happy, not rejoicing, weeping. In other words, an empathy with Jesus over what's happening in his own house. And he says, write their name in this book and put your mark on their forehead, the tav. Remember? And then he says, whoever, then go around the city again and whoever his name is not in the book, who does not have the mark, kill them. Men, women and children, leave no one alive who does not. This is the same thing. He promises that you've endured patiently, you've remained faithful, you have not denied my shem, my real character, therefore I will write my name on you. You know, you'll be set apart from what is coming on the whole earth. Well, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty important to me. So although that's specifically given to me three times, so will it happen? I have no doubt anymore. But for in the general case, do you see the lesson? Whatever the cost, we have the truth, hold on to it. Don't let anyone take your crown, you know? Don't let anyone pull it away from you. you have to, keeping the command, remember, is like, no, you're not having it. Even if it makes you unpopular, even if it causes, brings you trouble from the apostate, it's the same trouble the Pharisees gave to Jesus, as for the master, so for the servants, right? Because there's a reason you're not suffering for nothing, you're not enduring for nothing, because when God's patience ends, you don't want to be the other guy. You want the other guy to be with you. That's why you keep evangelizing, that's why you keep telling the truth. You don't want them to perish, but underneath that, you sure don't want to be with them, you know? If there's not many survivors, you want to be one of them, isn't it? After all, especially if you've suffered a lot, you sure don't want your suffering to have been for nothing because you turned around and gave up at the end. Again, with everything that's happening, like with you know people in these other churches, this is something else you can share, that real salvation is like this, that the, the real Jesus is worth suffering for. The real Jesus is worth enduring patiently for. Does that make sense? hope so. I'm going to, we're basically done now. I think one more page and, or half a page. Also notice it says, I see you have little strength, but you've kept my word and not denied my name. So this is not, you know, in the churches we've been taught about, like, being strong in the Lord. What does being strong in the Lord mean? Here, the one that's being blessed, it says, I see you have little strength. What does being strong in the Lord mean? That you are loud, that you are, you know, triumphant and all this, like some sort of warrior for God? That's not what he means. <laughs> being strong in the Lord means being faithful and, and being unable to be shifted. Unable to be moved in your armour. What is the armour of God for? Defence. So that you may resist Satan's flaming arrows and not be shifted, not be bulldozed off the narrow way by a bunch of firewood people. And that's basically what it would mean. Do you get the idea? So you, again, if you're, if you're a shy person or, a, you know, if you don't have a giant personality or anything, that's great. It's good. It's easier for you to be humble. Strength is about faithfulness, not about having a, you know, yeah. What else do we need to know here on the very last page? I think I've covered all that. Ah, so just the last couple of paragraphs, I'll just quickly do that. What's happening in the world, and most of all in all the churches, is there for their salvation. For people who think they're saved but are not, who are in, who have a kind of faith but it's not a saving faith because their Jesus is not Jesus. They follow, they're worshipping an idol but they don't know it. If God did nothing, because he's impartial, he could not admit them to heaven at the end. 
So what does he do? He breaks them to make them. He sends them into exile to cause them to seek him. You know, he sends tribulation, calamity, so that they ask themselves, where is God? And seek him. These things we've learned. Like, so all that you see going on, as terrible as it may seem and probably will get much worse, understand it's God doing whatever he has to to try and save as many of them rather than do nothing. Because if he did nothing, he, he couldn't let them in because they haven't known him. Remember what Jesus said? Many will come in that day saying, Lord, Lord. And they've done supernatural things. They just assume they're going to heaven. And he says, we don't have a relationship. You're not my disciple. The Jesus you worship is an idol, something you made up for yourself. You worship something, you serve something, you called it Jesus, but it wasn't me. I don't know you. And they're shut out. Well, does God want to do that? No. He'll still have to, but for, he wants to minimise the number of people he has to say that to, even if it means, like the letter to the Corinthians, even if it means they have to be hurt for a while, if it brings about godly sorrow to bring repentance, and that repentance brings reconciliation, then the reconciliation can bring restoration. You understand? Because God's option is to do nothing. If he does nothing, they're doomed. Does that make sense? If you can keep that picture, the other benefit for you is you'll understand that God at all times is sovereign over the whole process. Satan only seems to be winning. No, he's not. God has sent him to do this. This is God's plan. The agencies are evil, but it's God's plan. And the ultimate aim, the ultimate goal, is to bring them back. Just like Onesimus. He was a rebellious slave. His going away, he went away a rebellious slave. He returned a brother. You know, he went away useless. He returned useful. That's God's plan. The gospel is for sinners. He came to call sinners, remember? He says, I haven't come to call the righteous, but, the, but sinners. You don't send a doctor to those who are well, but to those who are sick. Right? So don't be surprised that God is doing all this. He wants to save them, to bring the dead to life, slaves to freedom, freedom from the power of sin not the end of church if anything it's the beginning of real church this kind of stress is what the first century first second and third century christians faced they faced being a tiny remnant in a world of apostasy a world that was hostile to them the roman empire who won god won are we all worshiping roman gods today no why the Christian, the influence of these tiny number of Christians with the Holy Spirit turned the Roman Empire Christian. You know, again, it's not about our strength, it's not about scale, it's about what God determines to do in and through us. So, that was the word of the Lord to me for us for this time. And the a very last scripture right at the end just to look, put a full stop on the whole thing is what Jesus says about the last days. We've read this a million times now. Matthew 24 verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. So hopefully we really understand that now. But then the next verse. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stands firm, persevere continue if you find yourself off course you know if the nav man squawks at you at the first chance make a u-turn make a u-turn because the one who stands firm to the end will be saved you do not want to be the other group and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as testimony to all nations and only then will the end come you couldn't make it any plainer could you so I really believe that's his word to us today because like I say, when I sat down, nothing 
till I asked him. And then he, I wrote this in one hour. You know? So, and that's not me. I really believe this is his word for us to encourage us that we are not doing, we are not trying to find a narrow way and walk in it for nothing. That it matters. The things he wrote for me in Revelation there, it matters. It matters to him that we persevere. It matters to him that we care enough to say, well, even if everyone else is going to abandon you, Lord, not me. You know, not me and not us. And if this makes you sad, makes me sad. So if you want to do something, I'm here. Bring me. Use me. Teach me. Where even if I'm small, even if I'm tired, because remember, it's his power in us, not our own strength. And being patient. Because for them, the 70 years, if you like, the equivalent of the 70 years is only just beginning. Consequences are just starting to form. It may be a long time before they break. So we have to just get on. That's why, you, if you read other things I posted, so I, God's wrote it really clear to me that my former ministry's finished because it's too late. It's no good warning things are coming when they've already come. You know, so God's re completely relieved me of that burden. And now, it's just a narrow way. So regardless of what happens around us, we need to be in the lifeboat and, a and willing to pull anyone that he brings near, that he gives us the ability to pull into the lifeboat as well. And I don't mean the ark, I mean onto solid ground, right? They don't have to come here. They just have to be in Christ. You know, no messiahs in this room, including me. You know, the solid ground is to be in the covenant on his terms, a real disciple. Whether they fellowship with us or somewhere else makes no, doesn't make a jot of difference. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for bothering to speak with us. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to receive and to understand the fullness of what you've spoken and what you've said by your word. I thank you, Lord, that no one has to believe me. They only have to look at your word and understand what you've said for yourself as I also have to understand what you've said yourself by it because we are all sheep and you are our shepherd. Lead us, Lord. Help us to be fruitful for your name's sake. Help us to be your witnesses for your name's sake. Because as I prayed at the beginning, you endured everything faithfully, terrible things, so that we could be saved. I don't want to see a drop of your blood shed for nothing. Whatever is necessary, Lord, to shake the heavens and the earth, to break stubbornness and pride, to bring the prodigal son back to bring Goma to her senses to return to her true husband all those things the many ways that you have spoken it by your word when all the time you're saying return to me and that I might return to you we pray for it Lord we ask for it we ask for the help of your spirit whatever needs to happen Lord our lives are not our own they belong to you who paid for it so, Lord, here we are, ready to go. We thank you. We pray again, Lord, for those who think they are yours and are not, who don't know, who have been blinded by false teachers and false prophets. Open their eyes as you open the eyes of Saul. Open them quickly, Lord, while there's still time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next week, it's the awesome... Ladies and one guy, is it? No? Just the ladies. Okay, so we'll look forward to that. Until then, good night and shalom.